I'd like to share with you a regional anesthesia technique that has evolved from an experience of 25,000 administrations between the years 1984 and 1991 at the Gimbal Eye Surgical Center. The underlying principles of the technique are safety, effectiveness, and patient comfort. It is important to know well the anatomy of the orbit and its contents. A good understanding of the bony architecture of the orbit and position of the globe within is essential. Inserted needles must avoid extraocular muscles, therefore their precise location must be known. Know also the anatomy of the motor sensory and autonomic nerves, particularly the optic nerve. Finally, be aware of the pathways of the orbital blood vessels. The following material will demonstrate orbit anatomy on the cadaver. This is an effective means of gaining the necessary information. On this front view of a left orbit, some minimal dissection has been carried out. Observe the inferior rectus muscle insertion. the inferior oblique muscle, and the lateral rectus muscle insertion. This graphic indicates the entry point of the conjunctiva for inferotemporal approach to the retrobulbar space. The needle placement was tangential. The principle is that a needle approaching tangentially will demonstrate globe rotation before perforation takes place. With further dissection, the eyelids and orbital septa have been removed. Again, the insertion of the lateral rectus muscle. Note that the globe equator is slightly in front of the lateral orbit rim. This, therefore, makes for easy access inferotemporally to the retrobulbar space. Here again is the inferior oblique muscle. The globe has now been removed from the dissection. The artery forcep is clamped on the insertion of the lateral rectus muscle. The probe demonstrates the amputated stump of the optic nerve. The amputated bellies of the inferior rectus muscle, the medial rectus muscle, superior oblique muscle, and the combined superior rectus and levator of the upper eyelid. The graphic demonstrates the needle position coming in over the inferotemporal orbit rim and entering the retrobulbar space. Observe the supraorbital nerve emerging from the supraorbital foramen at the superior orbital rim. The nerve has passed over the orbital roof and in this location is blocked, leading to anesthesia of the scalp on that side.
An emphasis at the clinic is to maintain a homey atmosphere with open rapport at all times. Patients remain ambulatory before and after anesthesia and surgery. Sedation is found necessary on only 5%. There are no meal restrictions. I'll give those to Karina in a few moments. Now, I now it's the left eye that we're doing for Prior to the anesthesia, today, upper eyelid margin levels are recorded for comparison post-operatively, and vital signs are checked. Automated blood pressure measurements are moment. taken on the forearm the right now. We're going to and the, the EKG after, with so wrist electrode. The blood pressure is run an electrocardiogram on you, and I do that with these little bracelets. I'm going to slip one on each wrist, and that's going to run the machine. Pertinent medical and blood ophthalmologic data are extracted from the chart, including the axial length of the eye to be blocked. Starting with a 20 mil vial of 0.75% bupivacaine, 5 mil is removed and replaced with 5 mil 4% lidocaine. To the resultant mixture is added 0.3 mil of the 150 unit per mil hyaluronidase. This gives the final concentration of bupivacaine 0.75% 3 parts, lidocaine 4% 1 part, with hyaluronidase 2.25 units per mil of the mixture. The rationale for the mixture is that the bupivacaine provides the prolonged duration and the lidocaine the fast onset and superb penetrating qualities. The hyaluronidase provides the spreading factor. I can have you look up at the ceiling. I'll be placing the drops in your eye, and that's the left eye. Now these are the drops that are going to numb the areas where Dr. Hamilton will place mm -hmm. his injection. We'll be placing the drops in your eye. And following the that, eye. with more drops that are going to dilate the pupil of your these eye. These are the drops that are going to numb the areas where Dr. Hamilton will place his injection. Okay. And following that, now I have the last more two drops, drops that are that going to dilate place in your eye right now. Eye. That one, and one more. I have the last two drops that I'm there going to place go. in your eye right now. I have a little cotton swab that I'm going to place one directly in the corner where Dr. Hamilton's going to put his injection. There you go. Now the second Slot. injection site is going to be swab that I'm going to place, I'm going to place directly second. in the corner where Dr. Hamilton's going to put his injection. The second Once injection site right is here. going to be over by your nose, and that's where I'm going to place it second. It's more over here. I'm in charge of your comfort today. No. Dr. Gimbel will be doing your operation. I'll be very gentle with the two needles I'll be using. Jackie has prepared your eye in a special way. Today. The needles will hurt very, Dr. very Gimbel little. will be doing your operation. I'll be very gentle I'll with be the touching two needles I'll be using. Here. Jackie has prepared your eye in a special the orange ball that's on the wall. Can you see an orange ball up there? The following section will refer in detail to the placement of the inferotemporal needle. Ask you to look at the orange ball that's on the wall. It is entering transconjunctivally and tangentially with precise instruction about depth of penetration and direction angle. With traction on the lower eyelid, the inferior fornix of the conjunctiva is opened up. With the beveled opening towards the globe, the needle is advanced in curvilinear fashion with enough medial component to carry the tip towards but not passing the mid-sagittal plane.
slight levering on the inferior orbital rim keeps the needle tip from contacting the inferior orbit floor. The depth of penetration is a minimum of 25 millimeters, one inch, and a maximum of 31 millimeters, one and a quarter inches, as measured from the inferior orbit rim, depending upon the size of the patient's skull. With the hub of the needle firmly held between finger and thumb, controlling any further advancement of the needle tip, one mil of painless local is slowly injected. Leaving the needle in place, the syringe is changed for a syringe containing five mil of full strength local anesthetic. This solution is then slowly injected over a period of a further two to three minutes the rate depending on the observed discomfort level of the patient. The injection proceeds slowly. I'm in the way with the hand, pricking or tingling in your lower eyelid, uh, Mr. Sleazy. Mm -hmm. If that bothers you, please let me know. I'm in the way with my hand. Yeah, right. The total volume used for this first injection is governed by the increasing orbit pressure as monitored through the upper lid intermittently with finger and thumb. The secret to patient comfort is the slow injection rate. Touching your upper lid there with my finger and thumb. Very pleased with how it's going. Really good. Lawyers were always very careful about giving informed how much we do. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> I hope we do that with everybody. Is that following you a little bit right now? You bet. It's going really well, really. The eye is massaged to dissipate the anesthetic around the orbit and into the facial musculature. Stay there for a few more seconds and change the syringe. A check is made for duction movement in all four quadrants. Two minutes after completion of injection, the second needle insertion is with a 12 millimeter half inch 30 gauge needle entering at the medial canthus, medial to the caruncle. Details of the depth and angle will follow. This is parabulbar injection and fine. discharges and two to five mil of, of full-strength anesthetic mixture. Good. Right. Well the volume, depending we'll on the monitor increasing movement. pressure developing behind the I'm orbital set. The needle is aligned eyes, almost to perpendicular to the frontal plane and at the face, the ceiling, except that there is a 10 degree side, medial angling the from the sagittal plane. The entry hand point hand. is on the Still medial side of the we'll caruncle, and one. in this location there is no danger to the tear duct here. mechanism. The needle is advanced to the full depth of the needle, that is 12 millimeters. The hub at this stage is right up against the caruncle. You can close your eyes if you want to. You all right? In this graphic, note that the needle is placed so that there is no chance of injection into the medial rectus muscle. Should contact occur with the medial orbit wall, which would be the ethmoid bone, the needle is slightly redirected. At this time, the eye is gently massaged for about two minutes' time to allow establishment of adequate anesthesia of the lids so that the subsequent decompression device will not cause discomfort. The eye movements are checked again and the decompression device is applied. Well, that's the eye drop. Sort of, what sort of taste is it? A super pinky is placed, applying pressure to the eye. The 
The diameter of the ball is such that it arrests on the orbit rim, preventing undue pressure applied to the globe. This is left in place for a 10-minute period, and the eye is routinely checked at that time. Following removal of the decompression device, eye movements are once again checked. At this time, 90% of patients with the described technique will demonstrate ocular akinesia and lid akinesia. In this particular patient, a supplemental injection is clearly indicated. The following graphics will explain the rationale behind the choice of injection sites. The inferotemporal retrobulbar injection predominantly contributes globe akinesia to the block, and the medial parabulbar injection predominantly lid akinesia. This schematic from the work of Kurnyev shows the connective tissue septa of the orbit, which govern the spread of injected local anesthetics. Four coronal sections are depicted, progressively passing posteriorly from the equator of the globe to the orbit apex. Of particular interest is the commonality of fatty compartments behind the globe in the inferotemporal quadrant. Also of great importance is the discrete nature of the fat compartment on the medial side, which is largely shielded off from communication with the rest of the orbit. This schematic shows the ligamentous diaphragm at the coronal plane of the equator of the globe. The medial injection penetrates through the medial check ligament and deposits solution within the medial fat compartment from and where it easily diffuses the through the thinner the areas to spread into the upper and the lower eyelids, there, at so which location the periorbital musculature is made akinetic. The only appropriate management of incomplete globe akinesia is to add further local anesthesia mixture rather than using intravenous or other sedation. In this patient, with still very active superior rectus muscle, following 10 minutes decompression time, a repeat inferotemporal injection of 5 mil identical to the first was made. Following a further decompression time of 10 minutes, the eye was checked again and found to be fully akinetic. The super pinky was reapplied and left in place for a further 20 minutes. The desired decompression time is a minimum of 30 minutes following the final orbit injection. We're doing a supplemental injection now in for a temperament. I'll be touching your Laura. For the strongly the blinking patient, the medial parabulbar injection is done as the up, primary block, and, one side. and as before, and this spreads side. into the lids, giving excellent lid again. akinesia. Up again. Oh, great. I'm really and happy. following which, the inferotemporal retrobulbar block can be done safely without putting the patient's eye at risk. we're working here at the medial campus, even the patient is strongly blinking. The net result at the medial campus is that uh, we're not disturbed at all. Now I'm just going to demonstrate that uh, the blink is a lot weaker now, Mr. Page. Just blink your eyes now. 
I'm much better, I can control much better the, the power in his eyelids than before. Don't have to fight them nearly so much. Because a prolonged duration lid block is part of the described technique, a clear plastic dressing, 3M's Tegaderm, is applied at the conclusion of surgery. It is left in place until the next morning, at which time it is removed by the patient or relative prior to return to the eye clinic for routine first aid checking. By using this method, in which the eyes and lids are sealed in a closed environment, a former occasional problem with corneal drying or abrasion has been overcome. An added advantage is that spectacle wearers can use their glasses without difficulty on leaving the surgical center. I'm just going to demonstrate that uh, the blink is a lot weaker now on Mr. Page. Blink your eyes now. I'm much better, I can control much better the, the power in his eyelids. Consistently successful cataract surgery requires perfect conditions of anesthesia, akinesia, and hypotony. Let the best surgery be made possible by the very best anesthesia.